Welcome to week two of the lockdown webinar series. Uh, I'm Siraj Tofi, um, head of Africa for Centura Global. This week we talk about labor law and leadership. We, we start off with Skal Khrif from Indivaldi just giving us a quick recap of um, any of the subsidies available to South African companies. We followed by Milani Ferreira, who is a labor lawyer and the CEO of LabSolve. She'll talk about the do's and don'ts of labor law during this time. And then I interview Professor Mies de Klerk of the University of Stellenbosch Business School uh, on leadership during this time as well. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Okay, right. So um, I'm just going to um, today just quickly navigate through the assistance again. I'm just going to briefly um, just run over those that we discussed um, last week. And then I'm just going to jump into some new ones um, or ones that we do have more detail um, available at this stage. So quickly, just last week topics, specifically going to discuss CIFA, South African Future Trust, um, some of the banks, what they're doing. Sukuma, and then there's other relief funding mechanisms available. I'm just going to quickly touch on that. So last week we just um, custom efforts. So if you um, are importing essential goods, you uh, get some uh, rebates on the customs and the VAT. On excise, if you manufacture um, ethanol and alcohol to be used in hand sanitizers, there are rebates there. And then we briefly talked about the business growth resilience facility. It's available um, for businesses that um, need funding, working capital fund um, um, that's producing essential goods. There's a business growth resilience facility. Businesses. Then there's the SME finance facility. So that's the businesses that's currently, um, it's hard uh, knocked by this um, COVID um, pandemic. Um, there's some relief funding available for SMEs finance, uh, SMEs. Um, we didn't talk about the restructuring of CIFA loans, but if you do have a CIFA loan, there is restructuring of those loans. We briefly talked about the COIDA benefits. So if someone is ill or self-quarantined, um, there's benefits that you can claim from the compensation commissioner. Um, like I said last time, it's important that if you claim these benefits, that um, the, 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 the employee needs to fall sick um, or ill because of his work duties. So that's typically, that's typically still applicable for those essential workers. If they get the coronavirus or need to self quarantine, then there is benefits in terms of the compensation commissioner. So we briefly talked about the UIF benefits. I think the one that's uh, most applicable in times like these are the TIERS program. It's a specific program by the government at this moment in time to, to, re, to give relief to employees through the employers. So the normal UIF rules in terms of credits and values uh, or the value that you can get is, 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 is waived. Um, the value is more. It's normally like 14 out 17,000 and then the percentages of that. Um, and then the credit system for normal UIF um, was waived. So um, there's just like a flat salary that someone can pretty much get from the UIF. So that's the TIERS program. Um, so reduced work time, if you put your staff on reduced work time, then the normal UIF benefits kicks in for reduced work time. Um, I, I had a lot of calls last week about UIF benefits. It's, it's, uh, it's important to note that UIF's got a formula to determine what the value is that someone can claim. So obviously it's capped um, the value to a maximum of 14,000 something. And then the minimum wage is the lowest bracket. And then there's a formula of about 30 something odd percentage up to 60% on a sliding scale. So the higher your salary, the, the lesser percentage you um, are eligible for, for UIF benefits and the lower the salary, the higher the percentage. And then it also includes UI, um, the credit, the credits that's available. So it's important to, um, to just um, remember that. Uh, so if you have an employee, a month um, with your um, or he's employed for only a month then there's a credit system that will um, only give him a certain time in, for which he can claim UIF. Um, that UIF benefits is determined by formula so it's not something that you just say well this is the value there's a formula to work it out so um, so we, we need to look into that. Um, then there's all this the illness and death benefit um, that we can claim in the event that our staff do fall ill or is deceased. 
Um, I briefly talked about tax compliance. It's very important in times like this to, to be tax compliant. You'll see all of these funds that's available. It's a, it's a requirement that you to do, you must be tax compliant. So please don't fall behind on your submission of your returns or the payment of your taxes for which those there, there are not any um, 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 assistance or relief. So it's very important, please be tax compliant. Um, in terms of SARS, there's provisional tax relief, payee relief and ETI. ETI is the Employer in Tax Incentive Program. It was already in place before COVID. They just extended the program and expanded the program. So please make sure to talk to your accountant, your tax advisor in terms of what the provisional tax and payee and ETI incentive all entails. Um, it's important to note that it's only from the 1st of April. So the payee that was due now on Wednesday, on the 7th yesterday, did not fall into the relief for the payee. It is for from the 1st of April. So in effect, your first payment on the 7th of May. So um, don't fall into that trap um, and become non-tax compliant. All right, so that's just quickly the topics that we covered yesterday. I'm not gonna go into more detail. Please ask questions, please email me afterwards if you need more details. I have um, sent out uh, in, uh, emails to my clients with all the details that you need to consider um, for all of these benefits. So um, please contact us, we'll, we'll help as far as possible. Right, so just quickly, some new stuff that I think we just need to think about. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of incentives and a lot of financing available in the market. And up till now, we pretty much steered away from it because it's a lot of paperwork and there's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of politics. But I think in times like these, we need to rethink um, the financing that's available. There is a lot of financing available. We just don't always go and apply for it. So for instance, CIFAR, they've got CIFAR self-directed lending products. I mean, you can do asset finance, bridging loan, revolving loans, and term loans through CIFAR. Um, so it's definitely something that you can look at. I mean, we normally just go to banks, but we have CIFAR as well. There's a whole range of products for the wholesale industry. So please go and look at, at, at the CIFAR and what they can offer. Um, yeah, there might be red tape, but but it is it is viable to to go and look into into these type of finances. Um, all my slides will be available afterwards, and all the links to the relevant websites is included, like you see there. So um, please go and click and go and have a look. Right, so the South African Future Trust, that was the, the, the Oppenheimer Fund. Um, so that's, uh, we last week we just mentioned it. So the details became clear towards last week. So um, the South African Future Trust is uh, direct financial support to the SME employees who are at risk of losing their jobs or suffer a loss of income because of COVID. So it pretty much entails that the qualifying SME will get about 750 Rand per qualifying employee per week over a period of 15 weeks. So down to a month, it's pretty much about 3,000 Rand per employee. And if you want to apply for this um, fund, it's uh, you just go to your bank. It, uh, it's administered through the banks, Standard Bank, APSA, FNB, or NetBank. So um, the banks will, will help you and you can apply directly through the banks. It is a soft loan or well, it's a very beneficial loan. It's a, there's a five-year payback period and um, there's no, no interest on it. So it's really just um, to help us getting to pay our employees through, through this time on top of all the other measures that is available. Right, so the South African banks, all the South African banks, most of the South African banks, there's various relief measures in place, um, payment holidays, et cetera. So please go to, to your bank. There's specific um, pages on their website where they set out all the relief measures. You'll see there's all the links available. Please just go and have a look at what your bank can offer for your small business or yourself as a self-employed individual during these times and make use of that. Right, Sukuma. Sukuma is the, is the fund that um, was set up by the Rupert family and um, through business partners. So, um, um, the Sukuma Relief Program is, um, is, is offers distinct and separate financial aid to formal sole props and close props companies and, and trusts. So there's um, a grant for sole proprietors. So if you're a sole proprietor, you can get a grant of up to 25,000 Rand. And if you're a business, a registered business, a close corporation company or a trust, there's also a grant of 25,000 Rand. And then you can get a loan facility of 250,000 Rand to a million. Unfortunately, these applications are now temporarily closed. They've received more applications, what the fund can allow, 
um, and obviously the the volumes that they received were so 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 enormous that they had to temporarily close the fund. Um, I see on the website you can still um, send um, become part of the mailing list. Um, I do think you should do it so that you can be up to date if anything changes and they make um, more funding available, then um, you will be the first to know. So um, even though the applications are closed, uh, please don't ignore it. Um, if you click on that link, you'll directly go to the Sukuma fund. It's administered by business partners. Um, it's also a loan. Um, the terms are a bit more different. Um, um, it's 12 month payback um, of holiday um, period on your payments. It's a five year loan and um, interest only occurs from month 13. So it's really to help as well. Um, but just go and have a look there. Right, and then some other relief mechanisms, like I said, just go and look at the DTI's website. There's a lot of funding available, maybe not applicable to your specific business, but maybe you do know someone that is in that can make use of this, so spread it wide. There's agro processing, uh, processing support schemes um, for, for, for value adding services to our, to our farming products. There's um, the Black Industrialist Scheme, and there's various other DTI incentives. Please go and have a look at it. I think in times like these, it's it's uh, it's important to to get these monies or to get the money to obviously um, support your capital growth. Um, also remember that the the government um, put special procurement um, uh, um, um, processes in place. So if you are essential service or a product deliver. Please go and look at um, what the government can can offer because they, they they do um, like to buy from essential service providers or product goods from um, from from businesses, small businesses at this time. So go and have a look at that. Um, go and look at the IDC MCEP loan if you're in a manufacturing environment. There's funding available fr from that perspective. And then last night I saw the tourism fund is open. So if you're in the hospitality industry and tourism industry. Please go and apply for that funding. It's pretty much a, a, a fifty thousand rand grant that you can get. They said they do look at the levels. So, um, but for all the business that's that's in hospitality and tourism, please go and have a look at that fund that's available. And then the NEF loan. Um, so there's um, the NEF loan. You can again just kind of have a look at that as well. So this is just other relief mechanisms that's available in the market. Um, it's not necessarily COVID direct linked or linked to COVID, but um, it is available. So go, please go and have a look at uh, those funding um, opportunities. Yeah, so um, just the, the same slide as, 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 as last week. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of things that change, um, but just keep at it. Um, don't, uh, don't, don't become negative. Um, think about your business. Think about your financing. Do your planning. Do your structuring. And uh, we'll get through this. Um, look at the official official channels if you want to follow some news like www.golf.za. Um, you're well, more than welcome to join our mailing list. We do send out the mails as we get more information and we send it out to our clients. Um, and if you really just want to contact me, there's my cell phone number. You're more than welcome to phone me. There's my email and our email or website address. Thank you, Shiraz. That's, that's just briefly from, from my side. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kalk. Appreciate it. It's a nice, just a, a refresh of, of everything that's there. Um, we will send out this, um, the, the, the information either as an attachment here or, or we'll email it to everyone a little bit later. But thanks for that recap. Thanks, Kalk. We, you, you can join the, the, rest of the, the parties there. Um, so uh, what we'll do is we're going to, we're going to shift across and we'll take all the questions. If everyone's okay with that, we'll take all the questions right at the end. I think Skulk will stay and be able to answer those kind of questions as well. So I want to introduce Milani. She's a, she's a labor lawyer, a qualified uh, lawyer. She can also do a short little intro of herself. Milani, feel free to uh, click on your, switch your camera and your mic on so that you can, you can join me up at the front. Uh, and Milani is really going to take us through um, the, the, the kind of best practice and do's and don'ts of um, labor law and what we, what we should be thinking about during this time. Over to you, Milani. Thanks, Siraj. Um, good morning, everyone. I hope you're going to find this in, as informative as I have thus far in all these sessions. Um, I also have pro, um, short 
that will be available to you all. Um, see various clients in respect of what their rights and obligations are towards their employees during this time. Um, we all understand occupational health and safety is a very relevant part at this stage of maintaining a safe and secure working environment as far as possible. Um, but this safety obligation um, excludes our staff, but anyone who visits our premises. Now, post lockdown, which is what a lot of the slide uh, presentation will um, refer to is, we all understand that mo most businesses will probably not be operating because they're not essential services. But what happens post lockdown? Um, those um, obligations in terms of health and safety remains. <clears throat> Many employers have a have a duty to review those perhaps, um, health and safety related handling and prevention. Everyone store all the lasers and uh, contracting with uh, cleaning companies to help uh, um, their businesses become more hygienic. But what about post lockdown? Because the coronavirus is not going to be gone necessarily in two weeks or three weeks or a month. Um, the insurance of adequate and appropriate will remain valuable part of due to the fact that employers and appropriate measures of liable um, the, those employees are obviously also contracted the disease as part of the course and scope of their duties in terms of business travel um, can also have a claim in terms of the OSH Act. We've also received various queries in respect of sick leaves. Now normally Sick leave, uh, well, sick leave is regulated in terms of section 22 to 24 of our basic conditions of employment act. And any employee who's contracted the COVID-19 virus would be entitled to claim sick leave and be paid for the period that they're off. However, in those can request, uh, an employer can request proof in the form of a medical certificate. Um, Employees should, however, immediately communicate with their employer if they have been diagnosed with the COVID-19 viruses. They need to, the employer then needs to ensure that any employee who has been in contact with that um, individual um, should be tested as soon as possible. They could immediately identify if there's a problem in the workplace. Now, in the scenario where you just suspect that you have contracted the, the, the virus or you may have been exposed to the virus. There's two options. Either the employee can self-impose isolation or the employer can request, and well, request is a nice way to say it, but force the employee to rather remain at home for period is defined as four days for quarantine. Um, in respect of this, this is viewed especially and uh, the government in terms of UIF and special leave in terms of UIF. And they don't have to provide a medical they have to be a document for employee that it is a COVID-19 um, virus exposure. In the event that um, an employee whoever uh, uh, from, a, from a personal point of view to a high risk area or during even during the lockdown period, visited family and friends, which is not the government requires, but unfortunately, um, then the employer can the uh, an unpaid leave scenario. But this should be detailed in a communication to the employer to the employees. Um, or if uh, the employer wants to be nice, they can say you can actually take annual leave. This is not a special leave scenario because you have inflicted that risk. Uh, based. Many questions surrounded the fact that we appointments or uh, most of them were to start the. How do we deal with those employees?
well, from a, are your employees and they are therefore entitled like any other organization that has been there. Um, um, of the basic conditions of the six months, however, an employee to one day for every 26 days work. Now, you paid for the duration. Some of the options employer even time and 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 over a period of if benefits or treated as unpaid leave. Um, from a family responsibility leave point of view, if someone look, needs to look after their child who's contracted the virus, um, that employee is entitled to at least family responsibility leave um, for, the, for the child's illness. In the event of a close family way, not related to COVID-19, but in this scenario, uh, we're referring to a specific person is that employee to three days paid leave. It is important to note again in the scenario of new employees, however, those employees can only receive responsibility leave entitlement if they have at least four months. Uh, people that only work two days or three days a week if they, have wor if they work at least four days a week. Otherwise, legally speaking, they will unfortunately not be entitled to family responsibility leave. Um, annual leave, many of our clients have applied annual leave during the lockdown period, which obviously means that employees may be that they would have applied during December would fall away and they would bring the word. Now, important for employers to understand that in terms of the basic conditions of Employment Act, specifically sections 20 to 22, the employer can determine the, the, the duration of or the duration of annual leave periods. Uh, take annual leave now. Um, it is fortunately not the employee's call, and, and, and there's a lot of misunderstanding in respect of this. Determine when taken, and hence why many employers have informed staff take annual leave during the lockdown period. Um, in those cases, efficient and again should reach an agreement, otherwise technically that is viewed as unpaid leave. Um, or the employer could advance annual leave and look at some work back arrangement. Again, the same employees in that you um, are only entitled to annual leave um, after you've worked at least any one point, then you are only 1.25 days annual leave. So if your employment was to commence now on the 1st of April, you will unfortunately not have sufficient annual leave. And employers will either there again have to make some sort of an arrangement or allow the IF or annual leave and then work it back. Um, some of the queries we've had in the past uh, two weeks regarding employees failing to return to work. Again, this is a very unique situation because reasons why I do not return to work post the lockdown period or for those people in services uh, should be working. It could be, it could be because they found out during the, the time that they were sent home as a result of lockdown um, and it or it could just be that they don't want to work for you anymore. They don't have the intention to return to work. Most important this communication. Looking for me to see how many of my clients or have an operative that you the relevant contact details so that you can obviously try and contact the employer because there is a duty on you to at least try and ascertain where the employee is. 
this, I agree the employer an obligation to inform the employer going to fortunately the CCMA and the councils and the court looks to say but what so investigate it properly, find out what's going on. If the employee, however, despite your SMSs or telephone calls, uh, you just cannot get a hold of the employee, then you have to follow the normal absconsion processes. However, if the employee tells you, I'm coming to work, I'm coming to work, but I'm sick, um, and they don't provide you with the valid proof, medical certificate uh, uh, wise, or they just don't report for work when they say they will, then you have to follow your normal um, discipline processes and and person with an authorities. But again, every case on its own merits. So review the facts before you act. Um, another numerous clients on definite on COVID nineteen pandemic We're going to have a huge on our business. It'll take us six months. So you have some instances, some clients say they don't know if they will recover from this for that period. What are our options? Um, in terms of nine of the Labour Relations Act, well, well, first of all, let me take you back. There's only three grounds for termination of an employee services. The first is misconduct, where the employee misconducts himself. For example, he doesn't return to work when he should. Two. Um, illness or non-performance, which falls under the, the incapacity um, topic, or third requirements. In other requirements based on the business, technological, structural, or similar needs of the employer. In other words, the employee has done nothing wrong, um, but to ensure that the business sustain the business has to review options of possibly retrenching certain people. As a rule that we're currently do, however, try other alter or try alternative measures implementing retrenchment. Um, the courts will definitely investigate employer social responsibility. Uh, in respect of what measures did you review or implement prior to implementing retrenchment. And these measures... You're saying that this, the, the, the court will investigate um, the, the... You can't just totally cut the... Um, uh, you can't just retrench people. You have to have done something before that. Um, do, do you need to hand out a 189 letter and go through the process of... Um, of consultation before changing any any um, work conditions. Um, so Raj, so in any um, one in any before uh, an employer implements any form of retrenchment, they have to look and investigate other measures to mitigate this application of uh, retrenchment. Um, so for um, the courts will definitely. Uh, have an even, uh, I want to say, a sharper eye on employers to see, but there were all these other relief schemes. There was UIF, there was a short time option, there was a, a reduced salary option, there was a temporary layoff option. Why did you immediately go for just a retrenchment? If a business can justify why they went for a retrenchment, no problem. But especially in the, uh, in the scenario where we are trying to retain jobs as uh, regardless of the, the situation we're in and hence why the government has implemented various schemes. The business owner will have to show that he has tried certain options prior to just jumping into a retrenchment. And, uh, and in terms of your second question regarding the 189, a court will definitely um, expect the employer to uh, communicate in line with a 189. 
Now, it doesn't mean that you necessarily, if we look at 189, there's two types of retrenchments. There's a section 189, a standard or a, a, a shorter period retrenchment, if I can call it that. And there's, then there's a section 189 capital A for any employer who employs more than 50 people and, for example, wants to retrench 10. Um, if he employs more than 50. And then there's a sliding scale if you employ 100, 20, et cetera, et cetera. But the moment you um, employ more uh, than 50 people, then Section 189 capital A comes into effect and there's a mandatory 60-day consultation period prior to the employer issuing a notice of termination. Um, so these alternatives that I'm referring to are alternatives an employer can investigate Issue the 189, say these are the um, alternatives we are proposing to mitigate um, this retrenchment process, uh, to avoid the retrenchment process, if I can put it like that. Um, and then we intend to implement it for a period of time. So reasonably speaking, two months, three months, four months, and then we'll revisit it. That in itself would prove to the court that the company has at least tried something prior to just implementing retrenchment. Okay. Can I continue? Yeah, I think that the sounds come across a lot better for me now, Milan. If you jump on and just do a shout out, we want me to through the slides. Yeah, continue, Pilfrid. Okay, last thing I quickly want to touch, uh, and just for those employers who've never handled a retrenchment, or even for those who've ha who have, um, a retrenchment is quite a technical process. Uh, the requirements on the employer to discharge the correct obligations in terms of process, communication, um, is quite intense. So I would definitely advise that you communicate with a legal practitioner, someone that has the experience and knowledge to assist you through this process. Um, please just note, I had a question um, yesterday with one of my clients. It isn't a one-size-fits-all approach in retrenchment. So there's no obligation on an employer to say, I'm going, if I want to cut salaries, it is applicable to everyone. Because every business is unique and every, uh, so you can apply one criteria in one division and another criteria in another division. So some, uh, in some divisions in a business, you may cut uh, people because the volume of the work is just too little. In some divisions, you may just cut salaries, and in others, you may decide to um, cut hours. Uh, instead of working a full day and night shift, you just work day shift, for example. Okay, but as I said, this is quite unique, um, so, uh, so contact a legal practitioner to assist you. The last element I just want to touch on quickly uh, is work permits. What about employees that are um, employed on specific dispensations? Um, now, the Department of Home Affairs released an article on 25th of March this year that it would not be accepting any submissions um, in respect of extensions of work or business visa-related applications. Um, so where does that leave people whose work permits will be expiring during this lockdown period? Um, the biggest concern we have is especially those employees in essential services who um, work in terms of work permits. Should there be an injury on duty during this time, the Occupational Health and Safety Act would not cover those employees. And we have advised um, those rather place those employees on leave for the duration of the lockdown so that they can ensure they have valid paperwork to render service to the employer. Thank you very much. If you need anything else, the slideshow will be sent to you. Our details are on there um, and we'll gladly assist with any questions. Thanks so much, uh, Melanie, uh, Molani, sorry. Um, so f feel free to mm -hmm. um, go back again to your seat by switching camera and mic off. And then uh, we will all come back on when we are um, when we're done and answer some questions just remember the the question uh, there is there are a couple of questions that are starting to, to to pile up you can vote for which questions you think are more important to answer um you can also ask a question anonymously as you push the 
the button you type in your question when you push ask it says anonymous or not so you can ask an anonymous question so um, I want to introduce um, Professor Mies de Klerk. He's uh, a professor of um, leadership and behavior and behavioral um, organization, organizational behavior at the University of Stellenbosch Business School. Um, and he also is head of research here. Um, um, Mies, yeah, thank you. I see you already on, on top on top of things there. So you don't have a, a, a presentation to, to to like a slideshow. So I'm going to interview you as as we go along. You wrote an interesting article um, in the last week on your thoughts on 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 this. But but let me start off by saying and and ask a question around. Um, the leadership of the country to start off with. So we're not really going to go straight into organizations and businesses. You, what is your your opinion of how President Ramaphosa has been dealing with this whole crisis? Uh, and 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 this is not a, a political thing, but we we could have been in a very difficult thing if this thing happened two years ago. Um, how do you think a, a, a President Ramaphosa is um, handling the, the situation in in your opinion? Yeah. So. Um... If one look at President Ramaphosa and how he dealt with this, you must understand that he was in a, and still is an extremely, extremely difficult position because if he took action like he did, and it later shows that the pandemic was not as severe and that the economic influence of that is really devastating, it's very easy to criticize him for maybe acting too quickly and too drastically. On the other hand, if he did not do that, and we had a similar situation like what is happening currently in Spain, France, um, Italy, and even the USA, he would have been criticized for not acting dr drastically. Um, it's a dilemma, and um, a dilemma don't have right answer. I do think as a leader, he stood up and he took a decision with the information that he had at the time. He did it in a way that he, not like a Trump promise, um, quick resolutions to it, uh, but in a way that he said he understand the problem. Um, he doesn't have all the answers, but with the current knowledge, this is the best we can do. It's a responsible thing that we need to do uh, for everybody. And I think he's shown tremendous leadership in the way that he has done it, the way that he has consulted with, with NGOs, with businesses, with other political parties. Um, I really think he's done a sterling job. Um, and he is also being lauded for his leadership by um, other countries in the way that he did, uh, did it and is still doing, doing it. Only a little bit of criticism that I might have is that maybe you can communicate a lit, little bit more regularly about what's happening and how I see things, but I think really is done well. Okay. And, and, and how can we take the kind of things that he's doing right or wrong and implement that into us as business leaders? I think most of the audience own this, their own business. How do you think we, what, what do you think we could be doing during this time from a, from a leadership perspective? So a couple of things that we need to do and also lessons from him is um, we don't have the answers. We don't know what to do. That's part of the difficulty of what we're dealing with. Um, the technicalities of what Skulk talked about, what Milani talked about, um, many things are happening. The situation in terms of the virus is changing every day. The economic difficulties are changing every day. So. Um, it's difficult decisions, and what one must be very careful about is to jump to quick decisions, um, simple solutions. Um, one of my students had the quote that for every complex uh, problem, there is a simple solution that is wrong. Complex <laughs> problems like this one don't have simple solutions. So if you need to do something, for instance, like Melania has said, um, certain actions you need to take um, about your labor, do it and do it decisively, but think about it wisely. Think about the other problems that it might create because in a complex situation, in a dilemma, the solution of the one issue creates a problem of the next issue. And, and I think, am, am I right that um, 
you know, often when we're making um, difficult decisions as leaders, it is under a stressful environment. And we've never been under, under a more stressful environment when it comes to this. You're saying kind of make thoughtful thoughtful decisions, but at the same time, it's very time pressured because if we don't get this right in the next couple of days, a lot of small businesses can die with before the right decisions come out and being able, you can't, you can't take the time to think through all of this so, uh, for too long. Time is a factor. Time is a factor. And when time is a factor, one tend to try and um, be the, you know, this image we had as leaders that we must be the strong person that have all the answers. Um, the, the, the leader of the cavalry charging into the enemy. Um, that doesn't work. Let's learn from uh, President Ramaphosa. Consult. Consult with your employees before you retrench. Consult with them on what other options are there. Um, you don't have to have all the answers. One of the things as a leader um, that are very important now is um, be vulnerable. Know that we don't know. I mean, if we Look at how many things have changed in the past two weeks. We don't know how it's going to play out. Um, accept that you don't know. And then consult. Um, listen to others. Um, and then also part of what we do is, although we must tend, attend to some of the technicalities, um, like we've discussed this morning, um, you know, what, what also goes a very long way is just to connect compassionately with other people. Um, people are scared. They are really scared about everything that's happening. Um, to a large extent, the, the virus itself and the health problems, but I think even more about the economic problems um, that is happening. And if people understand that you connect with them, that you feel for them, um, and that you will do your utmost also to work with them, chances are so much better that they will respond in a constructive way to help you um, in dealing with this uh, difficult situation constructively. You also, in your article, you, you gave a few practical guidelines for responsible leadership during this, this period. Do you want to take us through some of those things? I think you right in the beginning, and it's very much kind of ties into what you were saying. It starts off by saying serve and unite. What, what, do you, what do you mean when you say serve and unite? So um, I think just before I go there is to understand that people are scared, people are uncertain, and people are anxious. Also, when we talk about leadership, um, we're not talking about people in formal leadership positions. We all are leaders, um, mm -hmm. even if it's just the leadership I take at my home or the leadership I take in, uh, by, by being responsible in a grocery shop. That's also leadership. If I say surf and unite, um, let's look also now in terms of serving beyond our own benefits, beyond our own um, survival and issues. There are many people around us who are in need of help. How can we help them? What can I do for my employees? What can I do for my neighbor? What can I do for the old uh, Google that cannot go to the shop? Um, there are so many opportunities to help people, both physically and emotionally. We can also help them by being there and giving them emotional support. And Unite, you know, we can easily now start blaming um, the Chinese for certain things that they caused the virus, or we can blame uh, people who traveled and brought the virus here. We can blame certain communities for spreading the virus. Blaming doesn't help. We are all in this together. And let's deal with this together. Um, it doesn't change anything if we blame. So let's take um, the attitude that we're in this together and let's work on it together. And 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 accepting um, is it, it's also we we can't do much about this. It's we have to kind of if you try and fight against it, um, you, you're not going to get anywhere. There is a certain amount of acceptance that you have to take uh, of the situation. Absolutely. The next. Point I talked about is acceptance. Um, it is what it is. Um, it doesn't help we deny it. I think um, it is irresponsible to try and find loopholes in the government's regulations. I mean, it's regulations that were compiled on a very short notice, and it does have 
inconsistencies and does have loopholes. Um, don't try and exploit loopholes for your own benefit. Um, accept what is happening and deal with it in a responsible way. You know, um, there is a serenity poem or there is an entity prayer that says, uh, give me the, the, the um, courage to change what I cannot change, to accept, uh, to change what I can change, to accept what I cannot change, and the wisdom to distinguish between them. And certain mm. things, let's just accept that. And then what we can change, and I think that's the next point, is our attitude. Um, Victor Franco wrote about, um, we can't change our environment but we always are in control of our reaction to what is happening. Um, we can't change that the virus came here, um, that it happened in the world. We cannot change the impact that it's currently having, but we can change how we deal with it. Um, are we um, constructively working with it? Are we helping out others? Are we constructively working with our businesses and supporting our employees? Those are all things we can um, change that's in our power to change. And you, you know, the, w when it comes to, I, I liked what you said just a bit earlier where you said we're all leaders, whether you're the, the leader of a business or of a family, or even if you're an employee, yeah, I mean, employee, you can act as a leader. And I think that if we get this wrong, there, it is always a, it's always a spiral effect. So it's either a downward spiral of despair or it's an upward spiral of hope. Um, and, and, and so it's, that, that's also important, I would think, just providing some hope at, at this stage. Absolutely. Providing hope is, is a crucial aspect of this, of being a leader and being responsible. And people look up at their leaders for hope. Um, Napoleon Bonaparte was accredited for saying um, leaders are dealers in hope. And that is so true. Um, we all look at our leaders for, for inspiration, for hope. Um, even uh, uh, too much, we, we, we expect our leaders to uh, be messianic prophets that will save us from everything that's happening. We are all just human beings. But um, if we talk about hope, it is talking about helping people through it. It's like a President Ramaphosa would say um, to the nation, there are certain things we have to have to do. But if we unite and if we work together, we can overcome it. So different from what a President Trump said, firstly, that there's not a problem. Secondly, when he said, um, use this new uh, drug and this will solve it. Um, blaming others, that's not creating hope. Hope is in this that we, we let's work with it together. Let's look at the things we can change and make it happen as we go forward. Um, Mias, be before we go to the question session, one more thing here is that if during this time, as a leader of your company, you we, we probably in the same way that President Ramaphosa is damned if he does and damned if he doesn't, as a, as a leader of a small business, we have, we're going to do things that our staff are not going to like, whether it's, sorry guys, you have to use your leave, sorry, you have to short pay you, you know, all of these type of things. How do we as leaders rebuild the trust, rebuild the, um, the confidence in people once the lockdown is lifted? Because hopefully once the lockdown is lifted, it'll take us a couple of weeks to get the money flowing back in. We can put people back at full time. We can do those things. But there's, cert there's going to be a certain amount of damage that's created. How do we, mm. how do we go beyond that? So trust... Um, it's a difficult thing, as you know. Uh, the best way to prepare yourself for trust is to be trustworthy. Um, and if you are as a leader or trustworthy now, um, it will be much easier to rebuild the organization and to build, rebuild the trust. And what do I mean by that? It is to walk your talk. If you say something, then do it. Um, it is to be reliable. Um, if you promise something, uh, deliver on that. It is to be open and transparent. I already talked about um, discussing with your employees uh, what you can do, what you cannot do. Don't have hidden agendas. Keep them up to speed with what's happening. Um, and if you deal with these um, approaches, people will trust you. 
um, if they feel that you've been trustworthy, that you've been open and honest with them, that you do keep their best interests at heart, I don't think there will be a, a problem of rebuilding trust. They also understand. It will not be easy. Of course it will not be easy. But it makes it much more possible to rebuild the trust and rebuild the organization. That's, that's all we can do. Yep. Thank you, uh, Professor Mias, uh, de Klerk. Um, can I ask, um, we're going to go for some questions, if that's okay, Mias. Stay, stay where you are, Mias. And if I can ask Skulk and Milani just to, to switch their cameras and mics on, join us. And we'll just answer some of the questions that have come through um, on the right-hand side. Um, that's Skulk and uh, Milani, if you're still there, and Milani's there. Okay, so the, 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 the questions that were that came up, the, people have voted for them, so I'm just going to go for the ones that are on top. Um, do, do you report, uh, how do you report employers who have forced employees to take leave in lockdown? It's probably for Milani. How do you um, report employers? Well, um, the, you can report it through the Department of Labor um, and then the Department of Labor can investigate it. However, again, as I said, in terms of the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, the employer can determine when uh, employees should take their annual leave. So therefore, um, unfortunately, uh, your success with that, uh, with that claim uh, should, will not really hold any water. Um, and as long as people were tra treated fairly and consistently, unfortunately, there won't really be a claim. Where there would be merit in the claim is if some employees were um, forced to take uh, annual leave and others were not. That could become an issue because that then becomes an, uh, uh, an unfair discrimination issue which can be handled by the CCMA. So it all depends on, on what basis the claim, uh, you know, rests. Okay, thank you. That was well answered. Um, can an employer impose reduced salary without reducing working hours? Probably again, Malawi. Yes, and I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> I assumed it was, sorry. Yes, definitely. So, uh, but it must be done on consultation with the employee and by agreement. The employer cannot just say, I am going to unilaterally impose a reduction in salary or a reduction in working hours. There must be a consultation. Um, in respect of the question, can an employer do both? Absolutely, depending on the operational requirements of the business. Okay. And then it kind of goes on to the next question, which is, when the, when the, if a staff is put on short term, must it be through the 189 letter and the consultation period? Mm. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, that's answers two of those. If an employee imposes a salary reduction, then it decides to retrench the staff. Which salary amount would come into effect if you retrench an employee? The reduced amount or the original amount, salary? Very good. Uh, it all depends on the basis on which the salary was reduced. If the salary was reduced on the basis that it is an interim measure, or interim measure meaning it's for a short period of time, two, three, four months, then I would argue that the employee could say it must be on my original salary. However, if it is implemented as an indefinite measure, um, then the employer would look at the averaging of working um, of salary or preceding 13 weeks as per the basic conditions of employment act certain bargaining councils main agreements may have different calculations so whichever is applicable okay um a very quick one a spark um is the the, the the i heard the oppenheimer and rupert funds are exhausted and spent is that correct i think you said that the rupert one is yeah, the Rupert one is on hold at this moment. I won't say all the money is spent yet. I, th I think it's just part of the application process. Um, that's that's obviously there's a lot of applications. I haven't heard anything about the Oppenheimer fund yet, but the Rupert fund is in suspension at this um, on hold. It's say on hold for application purposes. Okay. What, um, Milani, again, what is the maximum time frame that an employer can impose a salary, salary reduction on a, an employee's? Um, legally, if I say legally, I mean there's nothing regulated in terms of statute. That really depends on the consultation period between the employer and the employee. 
Um, so unfortunately, okay. there's not a hard or fast answer to that question. It depends on the discussion. If, if, if someone is on a probation period during this lockdown uh, and they can't have that time to prove their worth, does the probation period just get extended? that it would be fair and reasonable for the probation period to be extended because that's the purpose of the probation period um, to see how the employee uh, his or her duties so remember our, our employment legislation is based on what is fair and reasonable and it would definitely be fair and reasonable to expect the employer to extend the probation period All right. um, just on um, that point uh, sorry Further to that, just to add on that, um, most employment contracts don't have a force majeure clause, which means if there's a national disaster or an act, of means that you can perform in terms of a contract. That's not always a standard clause in employment contracts. So that is why I'm saying we would rely on the common law and look at what is fair and reasonable. Okay. Uh, um, there's another one, which is... Uh, but just come through actually what what if an employee does not want to agree to the 189 letter for reduced salary um remember it's an alternative to retrenchment so if the employee refuses that alternative then unfortunately that employee will be subject to retrenchment and you as the employer could then prove but i have offered an alternative uh, I did want to retain employment, but unfortunately, the employee refused my offer. Therefore, the employee would technically be at fault, not the employer. Okay. Um, has there been any talk of rebates on VAT, um, Skulk? Can we withhold VAT now? I think you did answer that. Eh? Yeah, you can't withhold your VAT. There is, there is a lot of um, submissions to Treasury and SARS um, regarding the VAT and possible relief, but nothing at this moment, Tom. All right. Um, and then you mentioned Milani, I think this is probably again, you, you mentioned that employee years can be held liable if, if someone gets sick or dies because of COVID. Is that liable in what way? Is it in their personal capacity? So it must be, in, remember, so this is in a scenario where as an employer, um, as a result of COVID-19, I did, I place, I put no measures in place um, in terms of my operations. There's no sanitization, there's no policies, procedures, communication to staff. Um, so in terms of the, if there is a relate death, then the employer would be could be held liable if he was proven to be negligent or reckless in respect of of the occupational health and safety act so yes then obviously right. the the employer would be held liable okay another one is the minister of labor made it clear that these are special conditions therefore companies can't force employees to take leave is that correct um, I heard uh, the Minister of Labor, there's, we need to be very careful there. There was a retraction published on the statement made by the Minister because, in essence, what the contradictory to what the basic conditions of employment is. And currently, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act clearly says the annual leave can be taken at the discretion of the employer based on its operational requirements. So that's the special conditions is not law. Okay, guys, I think we've gone quite long on, on this. I appreciate everyone's input here. So that was the um, Labor Law and Leadership um, Week 2 of the webinar series. Next week, please join us. We talk about rebuilding um, after lockdown. We've got an international panel um, headed up by um, our chairman, of Centura Global, Asma Bashir, all the way from London. We have Josh Rohima from uh, the Launch Lab. He has started businesses in three continents, um, the United States, Africa, and India. Um, and, and, and topping it all off is um, Shukri Tofi, who is the CEO of um, Fort, as well as um, a expert, an entrepreneurial expert at Said Business School in Oxford, um, and a, a recent um, finalist in the EY Global Entrepreneur. It's going to be a great panel. Join us next week, Wednesday, the 18th of April at 11 o'clock. Cheers.